owns www.turtleman.com. Which is really great because he's doing much better, uh, more education than they, uh, the clown on TV for sure. <laughs> so um, I'll let John um, kind of introduce himself with his introductory slides. John Richards. Thank you, Russ. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be here speaking to this group today, and I want to once again thank Russ for having me. Uh, I started my fascination with snapping turtles at a very early age. About my first memories as a kid were dragging them up out of the creek. I was probably 35, 40 pounds dragging turtles that were half my weight out some of my first memories and as soon as I got bigger I was down the river and uh, that, that was just what I really really enjoyed. As I got older I came across a copy of Dr. Pritchard's first book Living Turtles of the World and it wasn't long before I was saving my three dollar a week allowance and uh, ordering reptiles through the mail and I think we had places like uh, Midwest Reptile in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, Bronx Reptile. There was a few of these places that would uh, that would send you reptiles through the mail order. I don't believe there was even UPS back in those days. But um, the first time I got an alligator snapper, I was probably 67. It was a $5 animal back in those days. So things have changed considerably. But I knew from that time on that I I really had found the holy grail. This animal did, I mean, I love turtles of all different kinds and sizes. By the time I was 10 years old, I could basically recite any scientific name of any species that Dr. Pritchard described at that time. But the alligator snapping turtle, it just did it for me. And I, um, you know, having all different kinds of turtles, uh, it wasn't until the mid-80s that I ran into the plight that this animal was suffering within our very United States. We were, uh, especially southern Louisiana, they were consuming large amounts of these animals. And it was kind of going under the radar. Nobody was really paying any attention to it. This was the 70s and, and into the 80s. And I came across some situations where I just couldn't believe these animals were being butchered at the level that they were. And um, being a different, sp uh, you know, sp species than the common snapper, uh, a lot of different um, applications. You can't, you know, commercially harvest this animal. It, it's it's not sustainable. Um, it won't work long term. And we were, what I had come across down in Arkansas in the late 80s was literally tens of thousands of pounds of these animals being butchered. And nobody seeming to care. The laws were, uh, would, would let this activity occur. We were lucky enough to get some of, uh, to get the legislation changed in Arkansas in 93, and they responded pretty quickly. To, uh, to closing the commercial harvest of the animal. Uh, by that time, most of the southern states had really um, suffered depletion. Um, there was a gentleman in uh, Georgia by the name of Al Redmond that really, really took a toll down in the southeast. Uh, United States in Georgia, the Flint River system, Apalachicola, Sewanee, um, and they were they were brutal, brutally efficient trappers. They would go in and, and work 30 or 40 miles of a river, and when you do that, you don't just get a few of the animals. You you really get uh, a high percentage of the adults, and once an area is hit. You know, you've got a long time before the young animals in that system will mature and become uh, part of the, the, the breeding population. So 
it, it was a bad situation, um, but uh, I had happened across uh, the situation in Arkansas. We got that shut down. That left Louisiana, which was kind of has the mentality of we have so much environment we couldn't possibly endanger anything. And it's just, it's an old mentality down there, but it took them considerable time to protect the animal. They did end up protecting it in 2004, but by that time, it was really too late. It was really about 20 years too late. But uh, we did, um, I did manage to get uh, close to a thousand adults out of Louisiana before they shut the season down. Got a lot of them into educational exhibits and zoos <coughs> around the country and around the world. Um, and I put together a pretty good breeding population of them myself. And uh, we're going to go through some of these slides and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've observed and what I've learned with, these species, with this species. This is uh, my pond, and I kind of made a bit of a mistake this year. I started water hyacinth then, and thinking, well, it'd be like home down in Louisiana. I had, I had a, little, a little wager with my son, Skyler, uh, who's 21 years old. That if we put like three or four of these plants in there, that, that they wouldn't take over. It, it wasn't but about mid-July, and it was like this. But uh, at any rate, these animals, um, in this particular pond here, I have, and you can't see all of it, it's off to the right, there's close to 600 adults in here. And they have just rooted up underneath the banks. They've got uh, uh, places that, that they, act, they tunnel up under there. They, they, uh, they're very much a colony-oriented animal that has no issues really being close to each other. You see it in the babies, you see it in the adults, and the feedback that I got from trappers over the years in Louisiana that, you know, you find these animals in close-knit groups. And, you know, I have to go back to Dr. Pritchard when he said, you know, if you really want to learn about these animals, you you have to go out in the field and talk to the people that have the experience with them, the, the years and the experience with them. You have to sift through a little, you have to sift through a little BS, but you can, you can shake down to get, uh, you dispel myth from fact, and, and you can see what um, these animals are. Uh, this is one of my other ponds, and you can see that I leave them rather wild with, with trees that fall into the water for cover. This particular pond is about 26 feet deep in the middle, but it, it's got down trees and just tons of cover. And, uh, and I found that it's a, it's a very good environment for them. This is a nesting female here. Um, nesting starts about Oh, usually they can start coming up about 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Some of them come up as late as 4 or 5 in the morning. And a lot of times they are still nesting when the sun is out. But it's, it's really unusual to see animals this big out in the daylight, uh, you know, nesting. But you can see that the, the nest is obviously right down there. And what you can't really see in pictures, but you can see in person is when they go to excavate a nest and put 26 to 32, 34 eggs in that nest, there's a big furrow of dirt behind that they move. So you can really, you, you can't miss the nest. It's, uh, it's pretty apparent. The, the problems that you have when you have breeding groups of them is one turtle will nest and go back in the water. Others will come along and kind of mow down the forensics. So you really have to get, and I'm sure a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about, you've really got to get down in your hands and knees and just look for subtle little clues of where the nest cavity is, whether you're looking at little, little front claws in the, um, in the sand 
uh, uh, the position of a tail, but it's, uh, it's something that really takes years of figuring out, and, e and even still, you still miss nests. It's just the way it, uh, the way it goes. There's another one, and you can see the, the, the dirt that she's excavated behind. And like most turtles, when they're nesting, they're, they're really in a trance. Um, they won't move off the nest once they've started laying. And, uh, and nesting is a three to four hour process with most of these animals. Here's another shot. She got a little bit on top of her snout there, but you can get a little better picture of, of you know, the position of the tail. And this is one of the, 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 the easy forensics where you see where that tail points into the, uh, into the, into the sand or dirt. And then the, the clutch of eggs is typically speaking right down below that part of the animal. It's much further forward than you would then you would, <coughs> because they're, they're placing those eggs up in that nest cavity with their feet and just pushing them up in. And I've got some pictures later that will we'll show you um, how deft they are at, at pushing the eggs <coughs> up in the nest cavity. And it's, it's, it blows me away every year when I look at how they construct these nests. This is uh, two females nesting, and this is just as the sun is coming up. This is probably uh, 5, 5.30 in the morning, somewhere around there. And you've got such long days when these turtles are nesting, you know, it's, it's starting to get light at 5.15 in the morning. And these, these turtles are laying. They're letting Skylar film them, and uh, they're going to do their thing and finish out. But the one you can see there is not too happy. <laughs> Got its mouth open. And that's uh, fairly typical behavior. They don't like uh, being messed with. There's another shot of a female. You can see a better shot at the, the, the classic telltale furrow of where they bring that dirt up and, and how the, the texture of it is just uh, it's like nothing you, you would see from any other phenomenon. So it's, it's quite easy to see the nest. That's me digging a, that's a few years back. <laughs> uh, but uh, excavating the nest there and trying to give you a side shot of it. And uh, that's pretty typical. Nests, like I said, they usually lay 26 to 32, 34. Oh, what have I done here? <laughs> Try hit what? Well, we can get this figured out. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
Well, um, not as much as you think. That animal comes out of the wild. The animal comes out of the wild pretty lean. Um, my idea is not to change that. Um, the intake of food is probably uh, about 10,000 pounds of, uh, of carp a year. And I've, I used to feed them raw chicken, but I've gotten to where I've teamed up with some of these bow fishermen that go out and shoot these invasive carp. And uh, actually, I feed them about 12 to 14 times a year. I've got about five and a half to six months of, of time that they're active. And uh, so it's not as much as you think, and it's really a good thing with the... Uh, with the carp, I'm feeding them organic, uh, no steroids or any of that in their food, and uh, egg production is good. It's steadily gone up, so I, I think uh, we're on to a good thing there. All right, we'll keep going here. This is an unusual nest, and this will, will show you how um, We've excavated this nest from the side, so you have a, a cross section of it. But you can see how the, the eggs are, this is a fresh nest, you can still see that the eggs have some mucus on them, um, how they're, they're, they're placed up in there. And, and we're not talking, uh, you know, a small little nest, we're talking, you know, eggs the size of ping pong balls and, uh, you know, 30 of them. Uh, but they're, they're placed up in the top of the nest, and in a situation like that, you are li literally pulling them out because they're, they're just, they're almost like stuck up in there. And uh, it's just a, you, you just wonder how the animal c can place those eggs up in there with its rear feet <laughs> without breaking any eggs. This is a photograph of my hatchery, and it's thermostatically controlled within a half a degree, and uh, it's been a work in progress. You know, you're always trying to get a little better percentage, a little better uh, uh, tweaking it one way with humidity, just to, you know, just to see if you can eke out a, a few extra percents on your hatch rate. And uh, this is the best way I found was to put my eggs in the center of the hatchery on racks. I found that around the sides of the, the hatchery, I would have hot spots that did not get the air circulation that, um, that it did like at the, at the front of a, a, a box of eggs. So I've moved everything to the center and having a lot better luck with it uh, that way. That is a little alligator snapping turtle hatching. And this, uh, I incubated these eggs in, uh, in perlite. I, I usually use vermiculite, but I'm just trying some different things to see what kind of results I get because it's, there's no manual on this with the alligator snapping turtles. You figure it out yourself. And uh, this is a nest that, uh, hatched, and this is a vermiculite uh, uh, medium. You can, uh, I get uh, 12 eggs in one of these little boxes, and I try to minimize the amount of dead air space in the box. It seems to emulate the nest cavity a little bit, a little bit closer to nature. So over the years, I've uh, changed from having a, a more inefficient, taller egg box that holds more eggs to a tighter one with, like I said, less dead air space in it. And we have, we have pushed up our uh, hatching percentage three or four points just by making uh, this subtle little change. There's some other pictures uh, of the uh, hatching process. And, you know, interesting as it is with these uh, little turtles, it's almost as if in the egg box 
they're interfaced. When one starts hatching out of that box, it usually isn't uh, six or seven hours and every egg in the box is pipping. Um, when you have a straggler, it's, it's uh, more the exception than the rule. <coughs> There's another uh, shot of uh, a box where they've uh, had, I've taken the uh, eggs out, the shelled out eggs out, and let the little turtles absorb their uh, yolk sac in the box before they're uh, removed and taken up to uh, a tank. This is uh, one of the tanks that I built for um, the uh, babies, and it is a 16 foot long by four foot wide um, rubber lined tank with water coming in from a, 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 another little uh, rubber lined pond. So I've got probably, um, I keep several thousand fish at a time for the baby turtles, several thousand little um, fathead minnows in there for the little turtles to, uh, to eat. And this is a closer shot of it. I've got it fairly choked with um, <coughs> Uh, hyacinth and this, uh, I believe it's a nacarus, this other uh, aquatic plant. And it's really hard to see in the photo, but there are little alligator snapping turtles just dotted everywhere in here, clustered up, and you really can't see them well with this uh, particular shot because it's so, it's such a big picture. But there's about uh, 250 babies in that 16 foot long by four foot wide tank, and they they're not crowded at all. I mean, there's there's plenty of uh, plenty of room in there. There's a little shot of them where you can see them a little bit more. How they uh, there's probably six turtles in that little group right there, where they can sit just <coughs> underneath the surface and lure and just reach up real quick and grab a breath of air if they need one. But it's a, uh, and th as the babies are, are nocturnal <coughs> as well. This was taken at night, so um, they were probably in uh, fishing mode before they were interrupted with the, uh, the flash of the photograph. That's another shot of that. Oh, that little turtle's got it, yeah. Thank you. Grabbed a fish and came up for air. <laughs> but I try to keep these uh, tanks as natural as possible. I really like using the, uh, the natural plants because you, you get much more of a uh, a biological filter where you know you've got the, the beneficial microorganisms. You're never doing uh, wholesale water changes. In, in in my particular situations, I use uh, the rainwater off the roof of my house to flush my systems. The rainwater I, I feel with this species is uh, extremely important. It's the pH is about six point four which is very nice to work with. You have no hardness to the water. Um, it's more of uh, the pH that, that these animals are used to in the wild, what they've evolved with. So it, it really didn't take a whole lot of work, but I, 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 I never would add any well water or use any water above 7.8 pH. It's it really can inflict some problems with, with these turtles. It can burn, the, the alkalinity can burn the tips of their tails off. They have uh, um, problems with necrosis sometimes when they're in extremely uh, uh, alkaline water and it can cause shell rot and other issues. So I use, I use rainwater. This is an interesting little uh, situation you, that rarely comes up, but when it does, I photograph it. 
This was a nest that we missed. And this is a baby alligator snapping turtle actually hatching from a nest on uh, my property. And you, I have seen this twice in the 19 years I've been breeding these animals. And it was just one of those special moments I was able to, to capture. You know, it's really interesting with these, these little turtles. You know, they, they hatch down in the nest cavity. And they will sit down there and absorb their yolk sac. And it may be two weeks, it may be three weeks, but they have to wait for that rain, for that top of the nest cavity to get to just the right consistency and moisture to where those little turtles are all out of the, their eggs in, that, in the, the cavity and they claw at the top of the nest. And when that top of that nest is just moist enough, it just collapses on itself and you get a little hole like that. And I can tell you that in less than 10 minutes, there was like 31 turtles came out of that nest. I mean, they, when, when that hole is breached, they gone. <laughs> um, and they're quite mud crusted little things. They don't even look like turtles. They look like little mud balls with tails. <laughs> There's a, that's hard to see, but that's, this, uh, that's an, the other one that I was able to capture on uh, a picture of. And it's a much more disguised nest. The grass has grown up, but I believe that's the little turtle right there coming up out of the, um, coming out of the nest cavity. A couple of little darlings there. <laughs> Well, believe it or not, in the business, I get a lot of people that ask me, you know, they're pretty sure they've caught an alligator snapping turtle in, you know, upstate New Jersey. And uh, so I have to have a few photographs on hand just to show them that there, there is, there are similarities, but there are differences between these species. This is an interesting picture. My son is kind of an amateur photographer, and he'll sit down there in the hatchery for hours getting shots. But uh, obviously, I'm glad my son likes it. And, uh, he he gets a lot of um, he gets a kick out of <laughs> doing his photographs. There you can see the uh, egg tooth and the nice little worm ready to entice fish. That's a not too happy individual, but you can really see the formation of the keels in this particular individual. The, just the, the magnitude of them is, is very striking. Just a, a, a real, that's just a magnificent specimen there. I mean, the way those keels have, have formed. I wanted to show you all, um, there's a lot of uh, consternation over sexing these animals. And one of the easiest indicators is, it's harder for me to see from this angle, but you all should be able to see that the anterior portion or the back of the shell is a little wider in the males. And you can see how towards the front of the shell it's a little bit narrower and at the back it's a little wider. I can tell you this, this is not a mature animal. This animal is probably a, a 11 inch carapace length. But you can tell the gender of the animal at, when they're sub-adults, before they're sexually mature, by looking at this configuration. And um, as Dr. Pritchard pointed out in uh, Biology and Conservation of the Alligator Snapping Turtle, it's the, the rib structure below the shell in the males has to stay open to, for continued growth because the males, you know, go on up to 24, 26 inch shell length. The females you scarcely see over 17, 18 inches. The females stay perfectly oval for life. The males you will start seeing this skeletal differentiation 
as early as 8 to 10 inches, sometimes as late as 12 to 14 inches. But it's, for me, it's a no-brainer indicator of gender <clears throat> without flipping the animal over to check the position of the vent. And the position of the vent is no different than any other um, turtle. It's, you know, the male is more distant and fattier, fleshier tissue down there. Um, but that was uh, something that some people could use as an indicator of gender before the animal is sexually mature. That is a female, and you can see how she is just oval as the day is long. Mm -hmm. And that turtle is probably 16 to 17 inch straight line carapace length, um, probably 40, 42 pounds, something like that. And that's one of those old females out of Louisiana that was going to end up in the soup pot, but she got a, she got a ticket north. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that is another one. I was uh, in the process of photographing and tagging all these animals. I was going through to find some good representations for uh, gender determination. I am not so much into the color morph thing with these, but a lot of people really get jacked up over that stuff these days. So I threw a few in here uh, that are just some of the more, uh, the more standout specimens that I've had over the years. There has never been an albino alligator snapping turtle that we, have, that we know of. Um, but we do see this uh, pigment challenged um, uh, genetics come up and people sure do go crazy over them. So much so that I, I won't even advertise them on my site. It just causes too much. This is an interesting color variation. This is natural, but you get into these golden yellow animals. There's no rhyme or reason where they come from. Uh, I can't figure out if it's an environmental thing, if it's a genetic thing, what it is. Uh, but they're, they're beautiful animals. And when you get into the, the, the two-tone with the, the kind of gold and the dark uh, contrast, uh, neat stuff really is. That is uh, a little fella in my, uh, one of my tanks uh, getting rather bold. Uh, Good size animal there, probably a 140 pounder, and just an interesting shot of how this animal has adapted the inside of its mouth, looking, you know, part like the organic debris of the bottom of the bio, and uh, with a little lure in there, and just absolutely cavernous. I mean, it's obvious that this animal evolved as it did with a huge head and mouth being a bigger target to uh, entice fish into. So it would appear the animals with the bigger heads were a little more successful in their endeavors. This is uh, one of those lucky shots. I'm not a very good photographer, but I thought this was a pretty classic shot with the tail coming right up out of the egg. and. Uh, uh, the little turtle with the egg tooth still intact. I want to talk a little bit about um, the prognosis for this species and uh, where we're at with that. It's as if man didn't do enough with the over-harvesting. We have some uh, we have some other factors that are man-related that just really prevent anything from really, as you all that live in the South know, the fire ants are just devastating to anything that nests on or in the ground. And there doesn't appear to be any quick handle on, on getting this uh, handled. They can literally kill a female sitting on a nest, uh, laying a nest, and they most certainly can take out 
baby turtles as they're making their way towards the water. And if you've been through the South, they're everywhere. And it's, it's, it's discouraging because, you know, that's, over harvesting is one thing, but now we've got this monster that we can't get our arms around. We also have just a, a, a burgeoning raccoon situation and armadillos. These animals are in uh, really unchecked numbers in the south. I don't know whether it's more of a, they don't have any predators, but Dr. Pritchard estimates that, you know, upwards of 90% of nests are depredated by raccoons, armadillos, skunks, and I can tell you that they, it is a buffet for them. I fight them off every year. Um, and it isn't just after the nests are laid. They can pick up that scent two months into a, uh, after the eggs are laid. I've seen old nests that have been in the ground late July, early August, coon finds them done. So that's, that's another problem that, uh, that doesn't appear to have a quick fix. We've got the destruction of environment, and as you all know, the alligator snapping turtle is, has its environmental niche. In the southeastern United States, it's more of a riverine species. As you get more towards the Mississippi, it's a bio and, and, and breaks along river systems, still water animal. Um, we really don't know what the long-term implications of these glyphosates who are in heavy, heavy agriculture areas where they use tons of Roundup and I just, I have my doubts if that is going to uh, have any positive effect on this animal too. It's, um, it's one of those we're just going to have to see what the long-term implications are. I've uh, offered captive bred baby uh, turtles to several government agencies, my own included in Missouri, and there just at this point doesn't seem to be a lot of interest in putting this animal back in its former numbers, and that's that's discouraging. <coughs> I would have been willing to give them the animals for free and enter long-term contracts. Um, that's the best way we have of putting this animal back to its former numbers. It's, it's not going to hit its former numbers when the deck is stacked against it. This isn't like the common snapping turtle that can live in any environment and it's just a, 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 a bulldog. They, they are fragile in their environmental niche. They do take 16 to 20 years before they reach sexual maturity. Common snapping turtle, you're looking at five or six years and they're, they're ready to put eggs in the ground. Not so with this species. Um, my turtles do lay every year. Uh, Dr. Pritchard's research uh, indicated that he felt in the wild that every, sometimes every second year that, that they, they were laying. I do know that my animals are putting eggs in the ground every year because my nests add up every year within six or eight nests. So that is encouraging. At this point, I'd like to open up for questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir. I'll tell you about that situation. I know that gentleman from, from way back, and uh, that was down on the Cache River, and the Mississippi had flowed, had gotten so high, it flowed, it made the Cache River go backwards, and it flooded his facility. Um, he, that particular individual is very well connected with the Arkansas Game and Fish and he got a license to go out and capture a 
number that replaced what he lost. And uh, he's back where he was. But yeah, that was a crazy deal where the water was so high. The, the, and it was flowing, it was probably 120 miles north of where the cash ran into the Mississippi. River running backwards overtook his whole facility. Is your facility protected a little bit better from that? Yeah, I'm in the hills of the Ozarks. I'm about uh, 1,200 foot elevation. And, uh, it, you know, it's amazing that, you know, where I live, it, up in the hills, the, the animals, that's not really their natural environment. They're going to stay down in the lower parts of, of the river. They're not going to make their way into the gravelly riffles of Ozark streams and stuff like that. But um, mine have adjusted so well. I rarely lose an animal. I think I've had two adults in the last five years die. One of them was about a 145-pound male. We can assume he, it may have just been his time to go. Um, but uh, they've, they've adjusted to life at, at my elevation, which is, is very unusual to to, to find an alligator snapper at that kind of elevation. Yes, David? John, in the photographs that you showed of the female laying, there was some sort of fencing around them. Were they able to reach that place or did you fence around them? I have to create good nesting environment. My area, my geographic area, the Ozarks, is noted for clay and rock and very little good dirt. So I bring in uh, sand and, and, and loamy clay and create a good, a good medium for them to, to excavate and lay their eggs in, and, and one that's easy to, to dig. So, and they just cooperate like champs. They go exactly where they're supposed to go. And I don't know so much about the other species of, of, of turtles like the nesting wise as far as like the snappers, but they love to nest on like a 45 degree angle. The hip. And so I build these ridges and they will be, you know, at an angle like this and excavating their nest. And one could assume that they are trying to keep their eggs from flooding out in subsequent high water situations. So they will always seek that high bank. And there are just spots that there is just no chance you're gonna find a nest. You, you, you know you're not gonna find it there. And typically those are the low areas around the pond. They really wanna get up high and they wanna get on an angle. And, and I've got plenty of that and they wear it out. By the time we've dug the 52 to 5,400 eggs a year, mm -hmm. they have turned some of those hillsides into Swiss cheese. <laughs> if you grow up on the guys have, or did you have, uh, how deep is the water? And you, know, you mentioned there were a lot of turtles in there. Yeah, what I, the, the situation I have is uh, my, my ponds are dammed up hollows. So I've got ridges on both sides with dams built across. So it's very deep in the middle and plowed with trees and limbs for cover. And they, they use that, but they also, like I was mentioning earlier, they love to get up around the outsides of the, uh, the perimeter of the pond and just burrow in. And, it, you know, it's, they will break huge pieces of, of, of dirt away that, that actually end up to be floating islands. And you'll find, you know, seven, eight, ten turtles clustered up, and they just, you, you can't ignore the fact that this animal <coughs> lives in little loose-knit groups and is very comfortable uh, side by side with others of its own kind. Common snapping turtles, I, I raise them too, doesn't work like that with them. They're more solitary souls that are doing their own thing and don't give a hoot about each other. And uh, it's, it's just one of the big differences between Calidra and Macroclemmings. With the babies, uh, 
How deep is the water in those tubs that you're raising them up in with the axle? Um, about three to four inches, and I love to keep the uh, the aquatic plants in there because it gives them cover. Uh, it sits just below the surface. They can just sit there and lure, or they can drop down where the fish are. And you know, you just try to keep your animals in a situation where they're the most comfortable and stress free and as natural as possible. We didn't see pictures of the fencing around the outside. How did you, what did you have to do for that? Well, it's nothing, it's nothing special. It's just two by four welded wire. Um, I've seen turtle farmers that use uh, the tin. Um, because of my situation in the Ozarks, I have very unorthodox and rough terrain that is like this. That you could never get tin to mate to the bottom of the ground, right? So it's fence up and like this. But and I've had a few get out and escape over the years, but. Um, they're not a, 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 an escape artist like the common snapping turtle. They just are too heavy bodied. This animal was just not designed to work on land. Like common snappers get up and move uh, across land with ease, walk completely up off the ground. Big alligator snapping turtle might walk 30 feet and then just kind of collapse in a heap for an hour and move again. They're, they're meant to be underwater, and that's just, just a heavy-bodied animal with an enormous head, and the shells are so heavy on those animals. And you have pictures of two nets that you, you found after the fact, or sort of hatching, but there's got to be there's got to be old generations in that pond at this point, right? I mean, yes, that, so. most assuredly. We find them of all sizes, and there's no way of knowing what year, I mean, you know, by the Department of Conservation, you know, wants a, an inventory and they want it to a number. It's, it's not going to happen. You, you just can't. Because it's, it's, it's an environment that those animals are, it, it's constricted, but, you know, you've got, for 20 years, I, I know I've missed nests. We miss nests every year. Uh, but in a way, it's, 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 I don't have any problems with that. Um, you submit a conservative estimate and they can't prove you wrong. No, but lying to law enforcement is usually not a good policy. <laughs> <laughs> and I can speak, yeah. <laughs> Western one now that they've kind of split this into Let me, I'm just curious, what's your thoughts on the three um, races now? Conjecture. And uh, I would say that I've looked at the uh, configuration of the uh, marginals where the differentiation happens between the uh, far southeast, the Mississippi, the one that's further back west, and then the Mississippi Valley one. I just kind of think I've got all of that working in mind, and all my turtles are from Louisiana and Arkansas, so I'm going to let the biologists fight that one out, because I just, um, I'm not sold on it just yet. I'd like to see what Dr. Pritchard has to say about it. Um, I, I don't know. I really don't. But there are morphological differences. When you get into turtles from the southeast United States that are more riverine, they're more mollusk eaters. They're going to develop bigger heads, like the loggerhead musks and the, uh, you know, the animals that, that, that eat, eat bivalves. Uh, you get into the Mississippi Valley, and you don't have, you've you got animals in bios and soft bottom uh, uh, situations where they're eating a completely different diet so they don't get those huge heads. You got morphological differences, but but as far as that uh, marginal scoot, it, uh, I, I, I don't know. You don't even have a few of the other ones to play around with? Uh, well, you're looking at Alabama animals uh, for some of them, uh, and you know, I, I wouldn't have any of those animals at my disposal to uh, uh, to look at. All my uh, animals were 
I did get some from Al Redmond um, from uh, southwestern Georgia and uh, and there are some different looks for, for animals that you run into uh, it's just subtle little differences whether or not the configuration of that those marginals is it I don't know so do you try to keep those separate from your other ones? No. Well, well, when I put them all together, th that wasn't even talked about when I married those groups together. And did, did you still spot those among your group? Or? No chance. <laughs> you see the tips of noses. You see females in the uh, in the wet, wet nesting time. Other than that, all you see is tips and noses. And unless you want to go out noodling, which I've lost a little bit of nerve for that as I've gotten a little older. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I was just curious about any kind of uh, nest predation, predation uh, in your facility. Uh, it happens. Yeah. Uh, they beat me every who, year who a couple of times. Crows or it, it, no, it's raccoons. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, not bad. I don't think they got me for one this last year, but they've They've roughed me up, uh, never devastating, but you know, it, it, it gnaws at you. Any kind of I trap with a live trap and try to, you know, relocate them. Um, a few of them have, but I, you know. Yeah, but believe me, I, that's happening. But, my Department of Conservation frowns on that, but uh, they frown on a lot of things, so. Yes, sir. You mentioned that you've increased your hatch rate by a couple percent. What is your hatch rate? About 92%, but it's, 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 it's a work in progress. It just gets, like, like I said, there's no manual on this. I mean, we try incubating, just, we do tests with them, the, the medium just a little bit drier, and, and, and then working with the, the dead air space, and, and it's, um, it's just something you, you always try to do just a little better at. Yes, sir? Are the temperature sex determinant, and if so, do you incubate? Yes, uh, I, I have in the past. Um, the, the fine work that this, uh, they did at uh, University of Florida in Gainesville, um, indicated that uh, at 78 degrees you would get uh, almost all males and you push up into the lower 80s and you get females. Um, obviously you're going to have in the wild you're going to have the females come off the top of the nest, the mix in the middle and the males off the bottom. Um, because of the number of eggs I'm putting up in my hatchery I hit it at 80 degrees. I will say one thing on incubation, that incubating at 84 degrees, if you wanted to just incubate for females, I don't like incubating that warm in an artificial situation like that. The turtles tend to hatch out a little bit smaller. They tend to hatch out with a little bigger yolk sacs. That doesn't mean that uh, it affects mortality of them. It, it just, uh, you get an animal uh, with uh, that hatches out a little bigger with less of a yolk sac, and it, it's a little easier to work with. And it, at 80 degrees, according to the work that uh, they did, you are gonna get a, a mix of males and females. If there was a, a state agency that wanted to step up to the plate and take some of these animals for a repropagation effort, I would be happy to um, do a four to one or three to one ratio of females to males, but so far we haven't had much luck with uh, garnering any interest there. Yes? What do you do with the offspring? The offspring of baby turtles? I have a business. And, um, you know, I have sold and incredible amount of these turtles in the United States over the last 19 years. Sometimes it's just mind-boggling. But, um, and I've met some of the most incredible people, just friends for life. It's been a very enriching experience from the acquaintances I've met. And, you know, 
for me, it's about awareness and being fair with people. And you do, you do that, you don't have to worry about making money. It just comes. Especially these days with forums and blogs and stuff. You don't do what you, you don't do right by people and you get tore up pretty good. Have you offered that to Bard or would you offer that to Bard? I would offer it to any state. But I, at this point, with them breaking out the, um, uh, no, with them breaking out the subspecies, um, reclassifying them. Uh, I don't think they'd want anything to do with the, um, the Mississippi variation of uh, macroclemmies. They would want their, I believe, the Apalachicola um, uh, subspecies. So, and, and they can do it. I mean, there's, there's, the, the, they've got a crew at Gainesville every year through there that would, would, uh, would, would be happy, I think, to take part in such a thing. I would, I really would like to, to work with my own state and Arkansas. You know, it's, it's interesting, I want to, to note this. And, uh, I used to sell no turtles to people in Louisiana. Like them. I was like, who would pay that much for a, a baby alligator snapping turtle? We've had all. There is more interest in that state. I have sold more down there in the last year than I did in the prior 15 years. There really is an awareness, and it's it's refreshing to see people come to realize that at one time they had this animal. It was abundant, and they took it for granted, and now they know what happened, that there's, there's really none left. Uh, for my estimation is four-fifths of those animals were trapped out of the state and during the commercial harvest. With our state bar, though, there's precedent. We don't have enough cougars, so they brought in Texas cougars, that, and, and they could conceivably look at yours the same way and say, you know what, if we want the rivers to have these again, we should talk to this guy who's willing to do the right thing. I, I would be willing to enter a long-term contract with any state on a hundred sex-determined hatchlings per year. We have a fishing game committee uh, uh, commission meeting in a week, and I can raise the issue. Talk to them and get back to me. At this point, I'm pushing 60 years old. I'm looking for a little legacy. <laughs> <laughs> Step out. Let me let me give you a few changes.